advanced passenger train. Despite its checkered history, even today it looks new and exciting. Five years ago, APT broke the British speed record by traveling at 138 miles per hour. Four years later, it was completely withdrawn from passenger service, beleaguered by technical and commercial problems. As a train, was it just too different? The normal approach within the railway engineering department was that of evolutionary design so that uh, only one or perhaps two things would be changed at a time. The major emphasis really on the APT compared with the conventional approach was that we would make a, a fairly large step forward and that was implicit of course in the specification for the train. But how do you develop an innovation like this? And what lessons have British Rail learned in the 20 years since the idea was first proposed? We're going to look at the research and development involved in producing the APT, how the project was managed, how that management structure has since evolved, and how BR are planning for their new fast train, the IC225. To find out all this, we're going to travel from Crewe to Carlisle on a test run of the only APT still operating. We'll also look at the implications of matching long-term research to the changing commercial requirements of the railways. Some would ask whether research and development can be justified in the day-to-day -day operation of a public service. On the journey, we're going to talk to some key people who've been involved in innovating British Rail's fast trains. Cyril Bleasdale, who was director of Intercity from 1982 to 1986. Alan Wickens, who is director of BR Research and was one of those who made the original APT proposal. John Mitchell, who became APT project manager in the later stages. And David Rollin, who is project manager for the new IC225. But first, David Bucock, who took the APT as an experimental vehicle and produced this prototype passenger service train. Well, the fundamental requirement of APT, in fact, was to uh, run at high speed, 155 miles an hour, and also to be able to go around curves much faster than conventional vehicles. And those two requirements led to the main innovative, innovative features of the train, which was first of all that to go around the curves faster we need to be able to tilt the coaches so that the passenger doesn't feel as though he's been thrown sideways. And so we have got slightly chamfered sides to the coach so that we can actually rotate the vehicle within our loading gauge, which of course is the imaginary tunnel through which the train has got to pass. That led to a number of requirements in terms of the bogey and suspension area. Whilst we've got higher centrifugal forces pushing the train outwards, the dynamic forces that we get on the bogey have got to be reduced, so that the total force level is no worse than on a conventional train. Simply so that we don't start having too much track maintenance to keep the track in the position it should be in. We have an articulated train where adjacent vehicles share a common bogey and that means that we have a high axle load, relatively high axle load on that uh, articulated axles, so that the braking re requirement became very severe indeed, a lot of energy, a lot of power to be dissipated and uh, conventional disc brakes were not adequate for that purpose and so very early on in the program we moved towards the hydrokinetic brake which is basically a water turbine made as inefficient as possible so that we dissipate energy uh, quite effectively. But many of these features arose because of a historical legacy, a railway network that originated with the Victorians. Wouldn't it be cheaper to build from scratch, as other countries have done? Building a new infrastructure is incredibly expensive. 
um, it can only be justified when there are very big traffic flows and you perhaps have saturated the existing system. And that was the situation both in Japan and in France. So they were able to make a case for building new railways. Whereas in this country, the Victorians were pretty generous in the way they built railways. And uh, consequently, uh, we felt that we could only make a case for high speeds if we used the existing track to the maximum. Well, the issue of funding uh, uh, and deciding to uh, move towards the APT was really based on how one could reduce journey times on intercity services uh, on this particular route, which is one of the most curved routes uh, in Europe, uh, with a population catchment of about 20 million people. And so it looked to be a, a major market to go for, uh, and eventually would come up for renewal. And yet, on the other hand, unlike the continent, it, it didn't really make sense to build uh, new railway routes. Um, and therefore, the board decided that this uh, proposition of high-speed trains, perhaps uh, employing a tilt, was something that was well worth investigating. Therefore, the board made a decision that they would fund the experimental APT train to prove the concept. It had taken two years of persuasion to get that decision in 1968, even though the Ministry of Transport had agreed to pay 50% of the costs. But with the E-Train a reality, in 1972, BR started track testing. Well, APTE was an experimental vehicle, and therefore the requirements on it were to prove concepts in broad terms, rather than prove that it could run for a 30-year life fulfilling those concepts. And, for instance, experimental train only ran a total of 23,000 miles. The power unit was a gas turbine and the brakes and suspension were the outcome of those original research ideas. They came out of the new railway technical centre at Derby, which fostered research on wheel rail dynamics, led by Alan Wickens and his team. Well, we'd done some basic research work on the dynamics of railway vehicles, and this showed that we could improve the suspensions of vehicles very significantly, and so we saw uh, the possibility of a train which would use existing track but travel at significantly higher speeds. What we'd done really was to provide a theoretical framework uh, to enable the designer to design these suspensions in a quantitative way rather than by using ad hoc cut and try methods. But to maintain passenger comfort at high speeds, the train would have to tilt. A commercial tilting train had never been built before, so a skeletal train was constructed to test and develop the tilt and associated bogies, the pop train. The aim of this development was to produce a train that was not just faster than conventional locomotive sets, but faster on existing track. The speed at which any train is able to travel on a given stretch of line is governed by the condition and curve of the line itself and the ability of the train to stop within existing signal distances. The speed limit for a conventional loco on this stretch would be 100 miles per hour or slower according to line conditions. But the APT has its own speed limits. Improved bogey design has minimized forces between the wheels and the track, whilst the braking system could bring the train to a stop, if required, from speeds of up to 155 miles per hour. This is the reality of an innovation that 20 years ago was revolutionary in concept.
Most conventional railway people at the time thought it was just a high-tech gimmick. The focus for the ideas then was the BR Research Laboratories under Alan Wickens. It was within this department that the original core team worked. Whilst the experimental train was not meant to be a full-blooded production train, you can't actually prove fundamental concepts without it being built around realistic hardware. And so the team that was actually formed in the research department was largely com uh, composed of uh, designers, developers and researchers. And there was, in fact, a nucleus design team set up of about 30 people that dealt with the experimental train. In April 1973, as work moved onto the prototype train, or APTP, the whole project group was moved into the Chief Mechanical and Electrical Engineers Department. The group eventually grew to 140 strong, but they encountered isolation, since the rest of CM and EE was structured on a functional, not a project basis. The Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Department at, at that time was the department which was responsible for all the design of uh, new rolling stock. And it is undoubtedly true to say that there was a certain reaction to the advanced passenger train concept which was uh, bred in research and viewed, I think, as a potential threat to this department. The move had, first of all, retained part of that project team uh, as an operational unit, but subsequent reorganizations within the department had led to fragmentation of that team, had led to the project leader, Dr. Bucock, uh, undertaking a wide variety of additional responsibilities, and therefore the singleness of mind which the project leader had initially been able to apply to the job had been lost. Yes, the project um, lost a certain amount in its cohesion because it was a, um, if you like, a, a well-knit team that suddenly was dispersed. And any change, I think, in the middle of a project, no matter what the organisation, uh, leads to certain difficulties. In December 1981, APT entered passenger service between Glasgow and London. But there were considerable technical problems, and the service was only to make three runs before being withdrawn for further development work. Even the return to Glasgow after the inaugural journey was not without mishap. The train's technical problems were primarily those of overall reliability, in that its operation was insufficiently uh, assured to put it into regular passenger service. There were key problems in the tilt system, uh, which had an unfortunate habit of failing and thereby exposing passengers to uh, unacceptable acceleration levels. The ride of the train was not adequate. Uh, there were problems in various electrical areas of the train. Uh, a fairly serious potential safety problem with the design of the wheel set, which took some very considerable sorting out. After its withdrawal from passenger service in 1981, the new team under Mitchell worked to improve reliability levels and reduce maintenance. This they achieved, and in 1984, the APT was used in relief service. Up. 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 On. We felt that we had reached a point where the reliability levels were sufficient to operate it in, in regular passenger traffic. Uh, but having said that, one must recognize that it did require a level of technical support which while sufficient to uh, carry passengers with confidence would, would have not been uh, acceptable from the point of view of operating a wide service of APTs. This was also coupled with some uncertainty from the business uh, commercial front as to whether APT really represented the product that it wanted. The whole economic circumstances Changed, uh, changed completely. And uh, when we looked at the cost of operating the advanced passenger train, which is more expensive because of the energy costs on the tilt system, the maintenance costs, uh, the energy costs in going faster, um, we, uh, our sums showed that we wouldn't be able to make that economic. 
1985, the relief service ceased and the APTs were broken up except for this one, which remained as a test vehicle. These engineers are testing one form of suspension for the APT's successor. But times have changed, and British Rail will not themselves be building the new train under their new commercial policy. If we look back over the last 15 or 20 years, British Railways Board, in effect, designed and built all its own railway stock. Recently, the board has taken a fundamental decision that that methodology is no longer appropriate. And from now on, the board procures all its locomotives, its coaches and its wagons by competitive tender, which involves producing very carefully reasoned and worded specifications, which lay down essentially the performance requirements of the new rolling stock. And this is as an example of part of such a specification, this particular one is the one for the new Class 91 locomotive. This is the locomotive that will pull BR's new train, the IC-225. Project manager for this contract is David Rollin. How does he see the difference between this and the APT? The IC-225 design objectives differ considerably. I think what we're after here is Yes, we want an ability to be able to haul sometime in the future, if the business case is justified, tilting coaches. But on the East Coast Main Line, where it will first come into operation, that isn't necessary. But the aspects I'd like to see we fo the business focuses on are reliability of the product, reliability both technically and reliability as far as the passenger is concerned, minimizing technical risk because we're on a very tight time scale. We only want to introduce new or innovation where it's manageable within the time scale and where it benefits the passenger. Really, the most risky area must still be in the transmission area of the locomotive, which is actually the only novel feature in that the Class 91 locomotive won't tilt because we've proved on APTP that it's unnecessary for the power car to tilt to achieve the level of track forces required. Simplification of the project has enabled BR to cut out some of the research and development stages. Principally, the reason we're not building prototype locomotives or indeed prototype coaches for that matter is because we don't have time. We have to judge the risks of going straight in for the locomotive. We have decided that provided we have the most thorough product shakedown program, then I think we can manage the uh, risks. To what extent then will BR minimize those risks by drawing on the technology of the APT? We must bear in mind that under the relationship we now have with industry, it's very much up to the contractor to design and underwrite his design. So that doesn't mean to say that he's obliged to pick up everything that we may have learnt on the APT. On the other hand, any contractor would be a fool to ignore some of the important lessons that we've learned, particularly things to do with unsprung mass effects on the track and uh, transmission uh, lessons and so on. So all the technology that we've learnt, particularly on the traction side from APT, is always available to those manufacturers if they so wish. APT technology might still be of use to BR. But if the business policy is now to contract out design and manufacture of a train like this, how does BR see the role of in-house research? Part of the research programme is, in effect, funded by the board as a strategic programme. And that is um, taking a longer view, not expecting the businesses to take an immediate interest, but um, to generate the new ideas for the future. We in the business are tending to look for uh, pretty early returns on our money. Uh, we're wanting innovation quickly because we're faced with the threat of uh, competition. Um, and yet on the other hand, of course, uh, the research are looking uh, very long term. I think it's possible to bring these things together. Uh, but again, you have to underwrite the long term things. And after all, 
a good business will want to survive, and the one way it can survive is to have a long-term R&D strategy. But I uh, stress that that itself ought to be underwritten by the business. So what are the lessons to be learned from it all? A very clear lesson from APT is that you do need to have dedicated resources with a very clear focus of responsibility and authority at the project leadership level. And there are inherent dangers in trying to do projects of this nature by generally disseminating them in a whole variety of uh, areas throughout a large organization. The way to handle it in the organization is to get top-down commitment from the chairman downwards to the product or the project. If the project managers and project engineers believe that the board are committed and that other functional directors and so on recognize that and the role that you've got to play in it, then you're going to have more chance of success. There are different views about why APT didn't become a successful passenger train. Some would blame organizational and managerial problems. Others say that the whole project was just too complex. Uh, in total, I think that is true, given the uh, resources that uh, are available within the railway and its ability to, to manage a large-scale development with many parallel developments going on at the same time. So yes, this is one of the reasons why, in fact, we uh, reduced the project down to the essential elements in the end, which led, in fact, to the IC225 project. Though any project in its early days of such a novelty as the APT in an environment such as British Rail, where not everyone had accepted this top-down commitment. In fact, there wasn't top-down commitment commitment if the truth was really known. Therefore, you had isolated interest taking a subjective view whether the APT was good or not for British Rail. Those are not the core ingredients for successful development. It's quite surprising how APT actually emerged despite the organization. We have a particular problem on the railway that we can't go and do our development in some private test track somewhere or up in the sky where nobody can see us. Whatever we do is really done in public. And so every failure that we have is uh, likely to be reported as a failure. And uh, every success that we have is not likely to be reported as a success. Obviously, since APT did not materialize into regular passenger traffic, in that sense, one has to say that we failed to meet what the long-term objectives were. Nevertheless, from a technical point of view, there has been a very considerable achievement in APT that has now been applied to the design of the future generations of railway vehicles.